This is a video tutorial for Phil 123, module number three, on the ontological argument. Um, I want to spend some special time talking about the ontological argument today because it's one of the hardest arguments that you're going to run into throughout the semester. Anselm's version of it in particular is incredibly tricky and incredibly sophisticated. I always feel like I've been run over by a truck when I go back and take another look at the thing. The other reason, one reason it's really a difficult argument to understand is because it's extremely compressed. The crucial parts of the argument all come very, very quickly and within a small paragraph. In fact, I've included on the handout for this particular module the really crucial passages where we see the ontological argument happen. If you blink, you might have missed the thing. The argument comes from St. Anselm, um, one of the leading theologians of the Catholic Church, one of the Church Fathers, and this is what he's most famous for. Um, he's important for any number of reasons in the history of philosophy, but his version of the ontological argument is one of the most famous arguments in all of Western philosophy, certainly his most important contribution to the canon. Now, if you remember, the ontological argument has certain features that distinguish it from the other proof arguments. The ontological argument is always run as a deductive argument. I'm aware of no inductive version of this particular argument. So it's always run as a deductive argument, and it's an argument that depends only on a priori reasoning. And remember again what a priori reasoning is. A priori reasoning is reasoning that does not depend on experience. It does not depend on observation. A posteriori arguments depend on observation. And both the cosmological and the teleological arguments are both a posteriori arguments. Again, by contrast, the ontological argument is entirely a priori. Anselm thinks that if we simply think about the concept of God, if we get clear about what we're talking about when we're talking about God, we'll see that he, that is God, must exist. And notice something interesting that happens early on in the passage um, where we find Anselm's ontological argument. Anselm at one point directs his attention to who he calls the fool. This is on page 30 and in the first quote on the handout. Now this is a little bit uncharitable, but just in case it's not clear, the fool is supposed to be an atheist. And an atheist is just someone who, does not, uh, who believes that God does not exist. The fool has said in his heart, we are told, that there is no God. That's our atheist friend. But notice what Anselm says, and now I'm reading from the passage. But when the same fool hears me say something than which nothing greater can be thought, We'll come back to that passage in a moment. He surely understands what he hears. Now, what Anselm thinks is that everyone, even the atheist who has said in his heart that there is no God, will agree about is that God is that than which nothing greater than can be conceived, that than which nothing greater can be thought. That passage is crucial to understanding the ontological argument. For Anselm, and he thinks everyone's going to agree about this. Whether or not you believe God exists, when we're talking about God, what we're talking about is a being who is that than which nothing greater than can be thought. God is a being that is so great that we can't even conceive of a greater being. If we could, that would be better. Now, if you think about it, that kind of makes sense given the divine attributes that we've talked about last time. Remember, traditionally conceived, God has three attributes. He's omniscient, he's omnipotent, and he's omnibenevolent. That is to say, he's supremely wise, supremely powerful, and supremely loving and caring. That's the sort of being that is that than which nothing greater than can be conceived. If someone's smarter than me, then we can conceive of a being that is greater than me. If we can think of someone more powerful than me, then I am not that than which nothing greater than can be conceived. You get the idea. God is so great for Anselm that we can't even imagine something better. That's beyond us. Okay. Now, if you accept that, okay, if you accept that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about God, Anselm is ready to run the ontological argument on you. And again, Anselm thinks that even the atheist will agree that this is what we're talking about when we're talking about God. If you're ready, 
The ontological argument comes in the next passage, and it's such an important passage that I'm going to quote it right now. That passage reads as follows, Surely that than which a greater cannot be thought cannot exist only in the understanding. For if it exists only in the understanding, it can be thought to exist in reality as well, which is greater. So if that than which a greater cannot be thought exists only in the understanding, then that which a greater cannot be thought is that than which a greater can be thought. But that is clearly impossible. Therefore, there is no doubt that something than which a greater cannot be thought exists both in the understanding and in reality. If that sounds puzzling, that's okay. It should be a little confusing. But we can actually make sense of this. We can actually make sense of this. The first thing to notice is that when Anselm's talking about something that exists only in, on the, only in the understanding, he distinguishes things that exist only in the understanding, that is, only in your mind, only in your thoughts, from things that exist in reality as well. Now, if you think about it, you can probably come up with your own examples of things that exist only in your mind, but not in reality. Any kind of fictional beings, unicorns, leprechauns, any kind of fictional character, Sherlock Holmes, Santa Claus, sorry to bust some of your bubbles, but there is no such critter, right? Now, we can talk intelligently about these things. If you told me that unicorns have one horn, I would agree with you. If you told me that Sherlock Holmes lived at 221B Baker Street, I would say that you're right. But these are things that exist only in our understanding, only in our minds, not in reality as well. Okay? That's the basic idea. That's the basic idea. There's some things we only have thoughts about but don't really exist. And there's some things that we can have thoughts about that do really exist. This coffee cup, for example. It doesn't actually have coffee in it, but never mind that. Now, Pursuing this, here's the cr another crucial part of Anselm's argument. And in the William Rowe commentary on the ontological argument, he makes this point very, very clearly, and I think quite helpfully. It's part of the reason I like the paper. Existence in reality for Anselm is a great making property. Okay. What do we mean by that? What Anselm means by that is that something that exists in the understanding and in reality is better than something that exists only in the understanding. Something that really exists is better than something that we can only think about. Okay? Now, we can make this a little more intuitive. What's a better kind of sandwich? The kind of sandwich you can only think about? but you can't eat because it's not real, or the kind of sandwich you can think about and have for lunch. Well, which would you rather have? The non-existent sandwich or the real sandwich that exists in reality? We can multiply examples pretty easily here. Anselm thinks that existence in reality is better, is greater than existence only in the understanding. To put it another way, a being that exists only in the understanding is not as good as a being that exists in reality as well. But you can see how this argument's now supposed to go, maybe. And on the handout, I've got my version of this argument. Okay? The idea is, first premise, it is not possible to conceive of something greater than God. Even the atheist is supposed to agree. Even someone who thinks that there is no God will agree that that's what God would be like. Even someone who doesn't think there's any unicorns, like me, would still agree that unicorns have one horn. Even the atheist would say that it's not possible to conceive of something greater than God. And it looks like there's only two options. Either God exists only in our minds, because we have thoughts about him, or he exists in our minds and in reality. Crucial premise is the next one. If God exists only in our minds, then it is possible to conceive of something greater than God. Remember, for Anselm, something that actually exists in reality is better than, greater than, something that exists only in our minds. But then by premises, um, number one and number three, it follows that it can't be the case that God exists only in our minds. Okay? Once we've got that in place, though, it follows that God exists in our minds and in reality. 
But to say that God exists in reality is just to say that God exists. Conclusion, God exists, according to Anselm. Because we can't even conceive of something greater than God, he must have all of the great making properties. He can't just be powerful, he has to be supremely powerful, otherwise we could conceive of someone greater. He can't just be wise, he has to be supremely so, otherwise we could conceive of something greater, and we're not supposed to be able to do that. But similarly, if God doesn't exist, we could conceive of a being greater than God, and we can't do that. Now, a lot of people, and the Roe article details this as well, have thought that there's something sneaky going on here. And sometimes it's much easier to say that something sneaky is going on than to say what is going on. One way of illustrating what some people have thought of as the problem with Anselm's argument is to take a look at the response by the monk Juanino, Juanillo. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. We don't know Juanillo for too much, but he's famous because of his response to Anselm. Now notice, Guanilio is a monk. He's a theist. He just doesn't think that this particular argument that God exists work, works. What Guanilio effectively does is kind of argues um, by counterexample. He gives us a version of Anselm's argument that is structurally identical, but it has a pretty clearly false conclusion. Guanilio wants us to imagine what he calls the lost island, what is the lost island? It's the greatest of all islands. It's the greatest possible island. It is so great that you can't even conceive of an island that's greater. That's how good it is. But look, we can run the exact same argument that the lost island must exist. It's not possible to conceive of an island greater than the lost island. That's just what it is. It's true by definition. And the lost island exists only in our minds, or it exists only in our minds, excuse me, or it exists in our minds and in reality. But if the lost island existed only in our minds, we could conceive of a greater island, namely one that existed. And by the first premise, we're not supposed to do that. So, and, so excuse me, Guanilio concludes by this very same argument that the lost island must exist in our minds and in reality. But again, to say that the lost island exists in our minds and reality is just to say that the lost island exists. What's the problem with this argument? There is no lost island. You can't find it on a map. You can't go there on vacation. It doesn't exist. This is supposed to suggest that there's, so pretty clearly, Guanilio's argument isn't really, it's not that it's not meant to be taken seriously, but it's not meant to be taken seriously as an argument that the lost island exists. This, Guanilio thinks, is one way of illustrating what's supposed to be wrong with Anselm's argument.